So I would like to present to you Mihalio uh, Joksimovic, Senior Software Engineer at Microsoft. Today we are talking about recommendation systems. So Mihalio, the stage is yours. Perfect. Please give Thank Mihalio Thank you very much. So it's a third block, an intense one, so I would suggest you to sit. There are some sit, yeah. All right. So uh, we, we, we have a very limited time, so, so let's just jump right into it, all right? So I want to give you a brief overview of who I am, and not because I think that you care who I am, actually, because I'm pretty sure that you don't, but I just think that who I am and my background actually goes nicely with, with what I'm going to talk about, all right? So I'm Mikhailo, hard to pronounce. I'm a senior software engineer at Microsoft, and my day-to-day -day work has nothing to do with recommendation engines. All right. Now that might come like, whoa, all right, why is this guy here? Well, I have to say more, right? Aside from being a senior engineer, I've spent seven plus years in rep therapy, like rational emotional behavior therapy, all right? What does that have to do? Nothing. But uh, basically, yeah, I have a few things to say on, on burnout and stuff, right? And finally, something more related, allegedly, is that uh, I became a father to this messenger of Satan, seven-month-old messenger of Satan, recently, and uh, that kind of taught me some stuff, right? Now, basically, why am I telling you this, right? Am I stealing the time from you? No. The thing is that, uh, you know, it's, it's just like data science, you know? Like, if you don't know where to look or how to look for stuff, well, basically, you don't see anything, right? It's, it's just a block of a blob of data, right? But if I give you tools to actually dig into that data, now you start seeing some patterns, right? Now, now it starts being obvious. So what's the relation between like being an engineer, therapy, and having a son? Well, there is a connection, and I think that's something that, that deep neural nets would find for you. You, know, you. you have no idea how they connected it, but there is a connection, right? And the connection between these three is basically being an engineer is what got me, to, well, what advanced me to, to becoming a burnout man, like, like a burned out like, like, like hell. Going into a therapy due to a burnout actually taught me that I have a very low self-esteem and low, very low self-confidence. Probably, uh, you, you can't tell right now, but basically I practice my, my uh, posture. And becoming a father is, is basically a result of that therapy. And becoming a father is quite interesting, you know. Watching young kids grow, you actually see the how, little bra how small brains actually make decisions. You know, L like you see the decision intelligence at its best, right? It's, it's, like, it's like whatever they want, they would reach out for it. Th there is no emotional what if or whatever, something that I, as a, like I'm, I really have huge problems with decision making. And I'm, here I am talking about decision intelligence, right? Well, I have a huge problem, but I learned in therapy how to make decisions. I had to learn it, but this little guy, well, this little guy for you, uh, this little guy, well, he, he reaches for the stuff, and it, mid, midway he would actually change his mind and reach for something else, right? So, so it's just beautiful to see a small decision intelligence, well, not no much intelligence there, but seeing how nature made stuff, you know, work out of the box. The problem is, as we grow older, given the, given the, uh, the decision making, well, we start being influenced by others, by group, stuff like that, you know? Like, there's a tons of emotions, but it's not just you, it's actually what group thinks, right? And basically, we arrived to today where pretty much every decision that you are making is, well, somebody is suggesting you what to do, you know? Like, well, like, your phone will tell you when to wake up, what to eat, whatever, right? And I'm not even kidding when I tell you that I literally think that these days, recommendation engines are taking over the world. L like, pretty much every decision is taken away from you. Well, it's your, your job is eased, right? But they're taking this away from you. They're telling you when to eat, what to eat, where to go, who to connect with, where to go to work, whatever. Probably cool thing, but not something that would work with, with small kids, right? And um, it's, just, uh, it's, it's not only that, you know? I, what I, this is really crazy, you know? I, I mean, this, this, this is really deep passion of mine. So, so I was quite interested, I'm quite interested in the process of, of recommendation. As I said, basically every time before I do this lecture, I would actually go online and see what are the current trends, right? Five years ago, it was one thing that we will talk about. And today it's, well, it's everything about deep learning these days, you know? Deep neural this, deep neural networks this, deep learning, whatever that. And I'm pretty sure you heard like a bunch of presentations today about deep learning, right? Which is cool, 
but I dislike it personally. I dislike it because just like what I gave you in the beginning, it's from the outside, it usually doesn't resemble any, any, any meaning, you know? L like, how the hell did you get to that, right? So I'm a guy who actually likes to see and understand how stuff works. And basically, that's, that's kind of what I want to talk about. I want to give you the building blocks and then talk about how deep learning uses that to actually, you know, like leverage and speed stuff up. That, that fine with you? Perfect. <laughs> Whoever, the, perfect. So, you know, my wife, because she heard me talking about recommendation engines like one billion times, probably. So she came, <laughs> she came, I mean, and she basically asked me, okay, so what the hell are recommendation engines, right? And I was like, well, I, I'm so glad that you asked. I actually have no idea how to give you in one sentence, you know? <laughs> I mean, like, and then I started thinking about that, and I came up with, I came up with a picture, but basically what I told her, recommendation engines are all about sparse matrices, all right? And not just about sparse matrices, but how do you actually go from a sparse matrix to a fully filled one, right? That's what recommendation engines pretty much are. Be it a movie recommendation engine or a product or whatever, you usually have users and you have items, right? And users usually don't interact with that many items. So, so you pretty much have a sparse matrix and you pretty much want to fulfill that matrix and then do a ranking of what you, you know, li like, like what you filled out. And basically recommendation engines are all about filling up the matrices and then doing the solving the ranking problem. Quite simple, honestly speaking. Right? Like why do we have deep stuff? I have no idea. Just kidding. Now, that's all cool, but what's also interesting in th is that up until 2006, believe it or not, nobody gave a damn about uh, about recommendation engines. I have no idea about why, but basically everybody was into data classification, regression, whatever, I don't know. But what happened in 2006, some of you probably know it or whatever, these guys, th these guys basically announced a competition. They started a competition and they announced the prize of one million dollars for anybody who could beat their recommendation system, right? And believe it or not, this, this on the outside innocent event is actually what kick-started the research in recommendation engine area. So if you actually look into research, you will see that post-2008, when the competition, it lasted for two years, once the competition was over, there was a like, bunch of research invested and whatever. And the winning solution was actually almost 10% better than, than Netflix's one, and it used something called matrix factorization, which I will talk, will happily talk about in, I don't know, 10 minutes or whatever. Now, that was 2008, whatever. Well, where are we today? We, we are today at TikTok and stuff like that. And I'm not saying TikTok because I think it's funny to show the TikTok logo. No, because I'm showing you TikTok because it was, I think, end of September that they actually published their, research, their, their white paper on how their recommendation engine works. And believe it or not, it actually uses a variant, well, combination of deep learning stuff, whatever. And YouTube does the same, and Instagram does the same, and everybody does deep learning these days, and I hate it. So I'll talk about something before that, all right? Now, one thing you really need to know, which I actually learned in therapy, aside from a bunch of other things, is that, well, we are engineers and scientists here, right? And we love building stuff. We love exploring stuff. We love deep diving into stuff. But at the end of the day, we are actually building those stuff th that for humans, you know? And no, no matter how complicated we are, well, there are some simplicities about humans, you know? At the end of the day, really, humans, all they want is to be surprised by something, right? So believe it or not, or not one of the, I mean, you, you can invest all the time you want into building a perfect model, cleaning up your data, you know, like training, whatever, deep that, whatever. But at the end of the day, one of the simplest, implementations of recommendation engines that, that prove to be effective is basically just returning a random item back to user, believe it or not. You know, uh, eventually at some point you, you actually give them something that they like and they're like, wow. So you, all you want to achieve is actually surprise the user. Once you surprise them, you can do that with random one, uh, <laughs> with, by returning a random item, you actually kind of got them hooked to your service, right? Now, Speaking of surprising users and users in general, one huge problem in, in, in recommendation engine uh, area is basically what if, you, well, what if you have a new user, right? Let's say we have Anna. Anna just came to our service and basically she didn't rate anything. She's new, right? So 
uh, to my knowledge, there is no way of going from, from empty matrix to fulfilled one or a sparse one. I don't know if there are mathematicians here who know it, maybe, but from what I know, there is no way to go from nothing to something, right? So how do we solve that? That problem seems to be something called cold starts in, in recommendation engine. So like how do you go from cold to warm, like from nothing to something to eventually fully fulfilled matrix, right? A lot of ways, right? But uh, there is one really simple, it's even used in a deep variant, but a uh, very simple way is just go and ask user, you know, like, Many websites, actually, when you register, they ask you, well, what are your preferences? And you go and tell them, well, this is what I like, you know, like Netflix, Reddit, Quora, whatever, I don't know. So it's actually quite simple, you know, just go, sometimes it's all about going and asking users, you know. And once you actually ask the users what they like, you can actually leverage something that is very simple, like the very first type of recommendation engines, be prepared, which is called content filtering, right? Content filtering is, well, type of recommendation engines where you basically recommend users stuff that is similar to what he liked, right? Let's say that he liked, uh, I don't know, he liked a movie by a specific author with specific cast, whatever, where you do just a typical data classification, you find similar items and you rank them and, and you just suggest them back to user, right? Quite simple, honestly. And there is a deep learning variant of it as well, you know. But that's, that's kind of your simplest recommendation engine right there. The problem with content filtering and, and humans in general, well, one of the problems with humans and, and content filtering in general is that uh, human-generated data is temporal by nature, right? Or that's, that's a very nice a book way of saying people have no clue what they like and their actually preferences will change a lot, you know? So content filtering is all about, you give me what you want and I'll just keep recommending everything similar to that. If you like Terminator, well, there is a high chance you would like Terminator 2 or whatever, I don't know. Quite cool, but not impressive. You have it on Netflix, like you have a bunch of recommendations based on, well, since you liked, I don't know, Game of Thrones, or actually that's not Netflix, but whatever. Since you like this, you might like that and stuff like that. Typical content filtering right there. Quite useful, but not really, won't surprise you, right? So. In order to actually leverage, uh, well, leverage the temporality of, of human data, we have, well, we have, somebody came up with something quite interesting. And that's something quite interesting actually comes from the fact, if you remember in the beginning, I told you about my kid, he's a typical content filtering based material, you know, like, like he just grabs for whatever, like, like based on the color, he would reach for it. But as you grow up, you actually move more towards something like collaborative filtering, right? You, you, it's, the, the nice way of saying is, well, you, you are what you, you are part, you are just like the group you're in, right? But like, you are like the group you belong to, right? So you usually have preferences like your friends do, you know? So collaboration filtering is another type of recommendation systems that actually leverage that fact. They basically find users that are similar to you based on the preferences and then use that to actually leverage the data, you know, to show you the, the, the content. So basically, if you're Darko and if you liked one movie and you want, you know, uh, like you want your engine to recommend something, well, you basically find somebody who has the same preferences like you do probably on a bigger scale, hopefully. You find Maria. Maria seems to have the similar taste like you and you just recommend them. Well, you find and then rank what Maria liked eventually a couple more users, and then you basically return that to user. Quite simple and yet quite interesting. It boils down to, well, basically how do you, you know, like classify data, how do you find, I mean, th there's just a bunch of ways that you can explore to actually find, you know, li 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 like find similarities in your data, right? Now, finally, I want to come to, well, I told you basically that uh, what, what Netflix did, th the Netflix solution, what it did is it, it relied on something called matrix factorization, right? Now, I have to admit, I mean, I'm not a math major. I wasn't even good at math, to be honest. Uh, I just started learning math because I found it interesting to, to learn math. So it took me a while to actually understand, well, to, to explain to my wife, which is basically the ultimate task of explaining to my wife what matrix factorization are, is, right? So what the hell is matrix factorization, right? Well, it's actually quite simple, <laughs> believe it or not, at, at least on the outskirts of it. All that matrix factorization 
is, is about going from, you know, like, like your matrix, your sparse matrix, you lower it, you basically go from sparse to a fully filled one, and you go back, you expand back into a, into, into a fully specified matrix. And there you are, L like two steps, you have a fully specified matrix, and you just solve the problem. You just rank the items again, and you return the, the solutions, right? The, the recommendations. Now, how the hell does that work? <laughs> right? Like, how do you go? How do you go from unspecified to a fully specified? I mean, what that, what's the catch? Well, if you if you heard about singular val value decomposition or latent factor models and stuff like that, well, basically that's some linear algebra. I don't even know if it's advanced or a basic. I don't honestly know, but that's just typical linear algebra and operations on matrices. But for mortals, and I'm a mortal, honestly, I'm not. I'm I'm kind of uh, you know like. like not so self-confident guy who, who, who was just average his whole life. So basically for me, I just needed a simpler explanation. And the simpler explanation turned out to be quite simple, honestly speaking. The simple explanation is that all it is about is basically, I mean, you know that the whole ML and everything is about finding those hidden patterns in your data. I mean, if, if you, can't do, you can't do much of a data science on a random set, right? It's all about some patterns, and the patterns are there be because humans work in patterns. No, ma no matter how much you dislike it or whatever your belief is, we actually always resort to some patterns, right? So what matri matrix factorization does, especially in this example, it kind of finds some of your hidden preferences, you know, like, like those hidden base vectors that actually base your preferences. And the simplest exp explanation of that is that matrix factorization actually finds, based on the movies, it could actually find, this is a very plastic example, but it would actually find some of the preferences, like you, you like sci-fi, drama, whatever, and that's your fully specified matrix right there in the first step, right? Like, you go from unspecified to some base components that are actually the basis of your preferences, what you like, and then you just leverage that back into the matrix, and well, once you know that, I don't know, like, Anna loves, loves, or Darko loves, loves sci-fi dramas, well, you just find, find all sci-fi dramas and give them the, the best rank, right? Quite simple, <laughs> I mean, in a way, right? Singular value, uh, singular value decomposition, latent factor models, and I don't know how many, how many ways to, to, to break your matrix are there, right? And finally, because, again, we are short on time and we are all about going into a breadth, into a, inst instead of going into a depth, I want to cover a deep learning, right? So funny enough, all that, well, at least from my, uh, from my research, <laughs> eventually all that deep learning does is basically it exploits what I just told you, but, but using the neural nets and the deep ones, you know, like it goes deep into the stuff, right? So basically you have like a feature extraction using DL, you have like deep collaborative filtering, you have deep content filtering, you, you basically, eventually, what, what YouTube and others use is actually just a combination of stuff. You know, deep learning mostly leverages like, like stuff that I actually showed you to do it more efficiently, more faster, whatever, and eventually give you your, give you your recommendations, all right? That's some strange sound coming from there. <laughs> all right. Uh, now, the most popular ones these days are actually hybrid systems. So hybrid systems based, base the base of what's mostly used. You know, like, like you would use combination of extract some features, make some content filtering, then do the, the collaborative filtering, just combine that and basically recommend that back to user. That's, that's pretty much, and uh, it makes sense, honestly. Like it makes sense that it's like, like one of the most popular things these days. But what's, what kind of frustrates me is that there is way more, believe it or not. Like, there is way more and nobody talks about it. I have no idea why, it's not interesting, I guess. But there is your typical problem of which movie to watch with your partner, right? The, the, the problem without a solution almost, right? Basically, find the preference of a user, of two users actually, or three users or, that, or whatever, use their preferences to actually build recommendations. Those are group recommender systems that actually Kind of, kind of work with this, nobody talks about it. I have no idea why. You have reciprocal recommendation engines, right? Which are all about, well, if I give you a match, I want to ensure that that match actually would match you as well. Online dating, like, like you don't want to recommend me something who would dislike me, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't use such, such 
such, such, such service for long. Job sites, right? I mean, you don't want to recommend me to, to, to work at Microsoft, the best company, if, if, if th there is no chance that I would actually come to Microsoft, right? So, stuff like that. So, so that's reciprocal. And once you actually recommend something to a user, well, you want to ensure that those items, are, especially in, in dating sites, you want to remove them. L like once they match, they're not available anymore, right? That's, those are reciprocal uh, systems. Then you have knowledge-based recommendation systems, which are all about, well, user comes to you and they tell you what they want, like they want to search houses and whatever, well, like they give you all the input parameters and how do you actually leverage that to most efficiently find similar, find matching items and to rank them, right? And there's a bunch of other stuff, but but said said we don't know much time to talk about it. If you want to talk, if you want to play, you not know, talk. Uh, I love one reason why I love data science is because you, you can do a lot without having any idea what you're doing. You know. So if you want to, if you if you want to play a bit with with recommendation engines, which which I would uh, highly suggest you to do, there is an awesome uh, library called Surprise. It's a Python library. It it supports most of the stuff that I uh, that I. Um, that I suggested to you. I'll just give it a second because I see your, uh, it's surprise. I mean, well, uh, like, you know, like surprise. Like, you know, so, so um, all right. Okay, th th is it possible that this is the only site that you guys are <laughs> like, like, like taking pictures of? Uh, like, like, oh my God. All right. Next time I'll talk more about surprise. Um, if you want to learn more, not play. If you actually want to go into the depth, which I went to, because you know, like a, <laughs> hey, I'm I'm a guy from a therapy, so so I like torturing myself. There are two amazing books. The first one, Recommender Systems, the textbook. It's it's I think it's called the Bible for for recommendation engines. Just just I mean, it goes into every possible thing except deep learning, because I think the deep learning wasn't the thing at the time at when when, when this book was written. And the second one might come a bit like, well, what? <laughs> like, if you remember what I told you in the beginning, uh, at the end of the day, you're actually building stuff for humans. You're not building stuff for, well, most of the time. If you are building stuff for humans, you might want to learn a thing or two about how humans work. How do they make decisions? And basically, based, you, you want to leverage that knowledge in order to build recommender systems. And th there's just no better book tha than, than Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, I, I read it twice. Quite heavy book, but it's basically a book that goes into absolutely every fallacy of human beings and how to overcome them. And What's also cool is that there is a whole conference <laughs> dedicated to, to uh, recommendation systems. ACM Rexis held every year. They only talk about recommendation engines. You wouldn't believe how, how many people are so, so, so kind, of, kind of invested in, in recommendation engines. And what's actually cool is that you can go to YouTube, find their channel, and every possible video from every year is uploaded to, to YouTube. So you can actually, there's just no excuse to, to not doing it, right? And that's quite about it. We are quite on time. Uh, I would like to, to thank you very much. I hope I inspired you to, to uh, look into the area a bit. And I'll be happy to take any questions if you have. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> should I ask it? Yes, you should. Will he answer? We don't know. But yes, you should ask. Yes, please. Mihalio, wasn't this just a marvelous presentation? Was it? It was. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It That's was a pleasure. Good. It was a pleasure. Now I want to, if there are no questions. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, there are questions. We have oh, five I minutes. Oh, I didn't see yeah. that. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, thank you for the talk. It was very You're interesting. Welcome. All right. Um, so, you started the talk with the element like all humans need a surprise in their life, and this is what is kind of a driving force behind some of these things that you were mm. talking about, but everything you talked about was based on similarity, on exploitation rather than exploration. So where does the surprise Ooh, come in? Oh, nice. Let me think about it. So basically, I might have, maybe I, 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 maybe I put it wrongly, which is a great feedback from your side. So what I was trying to say is that, I mean, wh what I was trying to make as a point is that you don't really need to complicate stuff that much. You know, L like sometimes the simplest things, well, s the simple things can be more than enough. 
And sometimes all it takes to actually make engine useful is to surprise a person with well something that they haven't anticipated before. So, so that's what I was trying to say. Maybe I said it wrongly. <laughs> yeah, but, but everything like collaborative filtering, content filtering is based on the similarities. So it's not like if you want to include hmm. the element of surprise, then you should kind of... Uh, how so, I mean, let, let's think about it for a second. So let's, say, so let's scratch the content filtering, right? I mean, it's, it's, there's no surprise much. I, I wouldn't assume that, that you could be much surprised. Let's, let's talk about uh, content-based filtering. Uh, so, sorry, collaboration-based filtering, right? All uh, that collaboration-based filtering is about find people that share the similarities with myself, right? And take something that they liked, which, you know, I mean, you could theoretically find something that you, you didn't like, right? I mean, which is actually the thing. Like, if you have people that like something, well, you could actually just go and, you know, rank it, like, it's, uh, as I said it in the beginning, it's all about how you rank the, the data eventually. Well, if, if you find people who have similar tastes like I do, then you take the items that they liked and you didn't like, and you basically maybe, maybe do some, some content-based filtering to exclude the stuff that's similar to what you already liked. You are left with the stuff that shouldn't be something that you liked in the first place, right? Well, I see it a little bit differently, but... <laughs> so, so, no, please do. <laughs> well, I see collaborative uh, filtering as a way uh, to, rep uh, to find a representation of the content because okay. you're kind of lacking the proper metadata or proper representation of the content. Okay. And one way to learn your content embedding is through uh, user data. <laughs> but maybe... I didn't uh, get that, sorry. So, 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 no, seriously, l l like, so, so basically... C well, can you just do it again? Let's take it no, but I'm yeah. curious actually. Mm -hmm. like, so, so how would you do it, or what what do you say? It's not is not. So in collaborative filtering, right. right, you're also doing some sort of matrix factorization, right? Well, you, you, I mean, you don't have to in the basic uh, li like. I guess you could, but you don't necessarily have to. Like the simplest example would be just like find a cosine similarity between the items that we both, you know, li like the dimensions that we both have, right, or that everybody has, right. I agree. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I just don't want to take take the floor. <laughs> but fully. Do, I'll, do we have other questions? Line. Actually, no. I, I love your question. <laughs> no, I mean, don't, don't I mean, uh, we have a few minutes. We have a few minutes if you would like. Does to anybody else have questions? Ah, okay. Well, let's 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 we can discuss. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, for th this yeah. is one Kay. of the best. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> Th uh, thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. So I just want to add something about surprise. All right. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I see where so to put more focus in the future. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so, for example, uh, there's some good surprises <laughs> and right. there's some bad surprises. Mm -hmm. Maybe what she's trying to tell, I, I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, good surprises come from some similar, like collaborative filtering, something similar but surprising to us. All right. And bad surprises are some, some mistakes that our recommender system might uh, take. Can you say something about that? How do we classify uh, surprise being good one or bad one? Honestly, I have no idea, but let me think about it. So, so uh, like, what would be an example of a bad surprise? Well, like something that you dis... I recommend you something, but you dislike it, right? But I think that... I really dislike it, so yeah. it's, it's a surprise. But who cares, actually? Th that's what I think. When, you, when it comes to human... No, no, honestly speaking, if you think about what I... Basically, that, that's the point that I, that I obviously transferred wrongly. My, my point is that when it comes to humans, it, it, th there is no... It's not really about, s like, correctness of the model. It's basically like they, they could get surprised with a random item, right? So I honestly think that, yes, you're right, there might be bad matches, like bad, bad, bad fits, whatever, bad surprises. But honestly, for me, when I, when I start watching Netflix, like 99% of the stuff is boring. It, it's, there's no surprise and it's boring, you know? Now, if you're saying something, if it would be something that I would be like disgusted with, right? L like, whoa. Uh, Where did that come from? Like, yeah. So, so that, that's a good question. How would you ensure? I honestly Maybe have there no are no bad surprises in in some. Can I uh, add on this? Uh, that, that's a good question. I honestly I'm have no idea. I mean, for bad speaking. surprises, uh, I know we can use, for example, feedback loops. So a lot of uh, applications are using it, like. Uh, 
uh, your request for feedback of the from the customer and yeah if it's a bad ah, surprise then you can ah. use uh, like a, yeah feedback uh -huh. in it yeah, then you, yeah, yeah, that's, you can that, feed that's, your model or if it's uh, like on some heuristics so it's that's some very additional very, yeah filtering. that's a very so valid point that's right. one option but, that, but yeah, out of use. the box how would you i mean th th that's absolutely perfect yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> How would you do it? <laughs> Thank you. Actually, uh, actually, great point. Great point. Well, first of all, like if someone doesn't doesn't watch it or watch it for a certain amount of time, you would take it as a negative example and you would downweight it. That's something I had to skip, but you're right. Explicit and implicit ratings, which is a huge thing in. Yeah, exactly. So, so this would be a hugely negative example, and like you would ju adjust your weights uh, mm. when you retrain your model in right. a sense. Yeah. And then for the surprise element, you would include it. It's almost like an editorial decision towards the end. So once you have your rank of your items, right. you would say, OK, um, I want to kind of uh, uh, allow for a certain percentage ah, okay, of okay. the content of the recommendations to be not from this list. And then you use a certain, again, cosine distance and looking for something slightly different. Makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah perfect. Perfect. All right. I would say that one of the beautiful things of the conference, of course, is not only the content that yeah, the speakers deliver. Yeah, I learn deliver, every time, actually. Yeah, but exactly. But definitely yeah. the debate Thank that you. it fosters. And you, and you, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody who listens. Yeah. So I would like to invite you all, of course, to use the networking opportunities either during lunch, during coffee breaks, or even during the cocktail party tonight, which you are coming to, to discuss about recommendation systems I would love and to. surprises. Yeah. <laughs> you can find me at the Microsoft booth. Honestly speaking, like we can talk. I'll be there for. Yeah. In the pauses, so yeah. This conversation will continue definitely. Yeah, Thank, you very much, <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.